In this short little video, I want to take a moment to talk about the nature of science, what that means, and how it differs from how you've probably thought about science in the past. So what do we mean when we talk about science? When we talk about the nature of science, we're talking about the big picture idea of science. Not science, you know, writ small, but science writ large. What is science in general? All we're talking about when we talk about science is a way to look at reality. There's a lot of ways to look at reality. You could take it from a mystical standpoint. You could take it from a kind of lyrical standpoint. You can even take it from a natural standpoint or what we call an empirical standpoint. And all we're talking about here is that we want to look at reality in a testable manner. Some way in which we're using physical descriptions and explanations for reality, not mystical or um, allegorical reasons for what happens. Now to do this, we've got to actually do the experiments. So we're going to talk about how science describes these. Now, when I say describe, I've immediately hit on one of the biggest problems in science. And that problem is that Often we use words in science that have meanings to people in an everyday sense, but they mean something different in science. They mean something a little more distinct in science. Science moving away from this kind of comical, simplistic version into more elaborated and mature version of science. So let's talk about science. So. If I say we make hypothesis to explain observations, so we make a prediction that allows us to try to explain what we see in our everyday world. And then once we do a number of experiments, that helps us support this hypothesis and turn it into a theory. Then we do more experiments on our theory. We prove our theory correct, so it becomes a law. Make sense? Yeah, some of you are kind of like, eh, it's the f pretty early in this presentation still, so I'm betting there's more to it. And you'd be right. You'd be right. I call it Schoolhouse Rock version of science. Schoolhouse Rock were these little cartoons in between the big cartoons on Saturday morning when I was a kid. And they were trying to explain complex topics of government or grammar or personal finance or any number of things in ways that were simple enough for the kids sitting in front of TV watching Pac-Man. Yes, he used to have a cartoon watching Pac-Man on TV, right? And there's a whole song that goes to it. And no, I'm not going to sing it because I don't want to break my microphone, okay? But you can look it up on YouTube if you want. We want to move beyond this. We want to move beyond that K-12 understanding of science where you were limited by how much time the teacher had to tell you the big picture stuff before she had to focus on the fine details of the bubble test and into the big picture stuff. So let's give an example of what I meant by words can have more than one meaning. Think about the word apocalypse, all right? Not a bad word, most people have an idea of that in their head. Put a picture in your head that defines that word to you. This comes to mind. All right? Yeah, kind of, sort of, maybe. Make sense? You're looking at it going, yeah, yeah, that kind of makes sense. End of the world, end of days, Armageddon. Yeah, sure. If I asked 100 people at random on the street, betting 99 plus would give me this. But if I happened to run into my old theology teacher, if I happened to run into Father Thomas, he would say, Mr. Ireland, I'm disappointed in you. From Apocalypsis. And it means a revelation visited upon a few, but withheld from many. I'm sorely disappointed in you. And that's exactly it. If you're talking pure theology, if you're old school theology, you would know that Revelation, the book of Revelation, used to actually be called the Apocalypse of St. John, the vision of St. John. So within theology, Apocalypse means something very, very specific. But in everyday sense, it means something completely different. Are either of them wrong? No, not within the sphere they're talking to, all right? Let's look at the words of science in the sphere of science.
talk about hypothesis. Now there are two phrases I can always say that I know the answer I'll get. One I can ask you is, what does a mitochondria do? And anybody who's taking biology will tell me it's the powerhouse of the cell. And if I ask you, what is a hypothesis? Pretty much anybody who's ever studied is an educated guess. I heard you say it through the microphone. All right. Good start, not a good ending point. It's too easy. For one, you fail criteria of scientific a scientific hypothesis. One scientific hypothesis is you have to be able to test the prediction you just made. Educated guess in no way means that you have to be able to test it. I mean, it might imply it, but it doesn't it doesn't say that. It doesn't mean that. Classic version of writing out a hypothesis is an if-then statement. If I do A, then B will occur. Now we'll expand a little bit and get the educated part by saying, if I do A, then B will occur because of C. Right? That's a scientific hypothesis. Right? What we're trying to do is give a prediction on how something works. Right? You have to have some idea of how you think it works to make that prediction. And that's what the hypothesis is, that prediction based on your understanding. And, of course, you want to be predicting something that you don't know. Now, granted, the labs we're doing in this semester, some of you probably already know what's going to happen. But if you're trying to really do science, you know, writ large, you're trying to predict the unknown. You're trying to push that boundary of knowledge one little piece farther out. Now, let's go to theory. Theory and hypothesis are linked together. The hypothesis is a specific prediction. The theory is the model that powers that prediction. First and foremost, I cannot emphasize this enough. You cannot prove a theory. You can falsify one, but you cannot prove it. Every scientist knows when to tune that science person out on TV when they say, well, if this was true, they'd prove it. Or it's just a theory. We know that's hokum. It doesn't work that way. To prove a theory, you would have to get every single possible version of that idea taken care of and experimentally tested. And you cannot do that. So you can never prove a theory, but you can falsify them. What the theory is, is it's taking those predictions that you made, expanding on those, advancing those, and coming up with a general model to explain how the system works. It is the best possible model at a given time as to how a system works. And new predictions, right? So each prediction has the possibility to falsify that theory. Because theory makes a new prediction. I then do that experiment. I test it. And if the test is wrong, if the prediction doesn't hold, then something's wrong with the model that gave me that prediction. But if the theory holds, right? If I do the prediction and the prediction works, I didn't prove the theory correct. I just failed to falsify at that time. And that's a really tricky thing for people to get past. Last is the law. Now I can tell you the major misunderstanding with the law in one simple example. All of you have heard of the law of gravity, right? <clears throat> Talk about all time in NASA briefings or any number of other things. Law of gravity is fairly simple. You took a basic physics class, you know that if you drop an object, it accelerates towards the ground at 9.81 meters per second squared. It's a mathematical description of the law of gravity on Earth. What theory of gravity got proven to be that law? And you're like, ah, right? As far as I know, there are three major theories of gravity. There is... Einstein's theory of gravity, which is based on warping of space-time due to mass. There is Newton's old-style masses attract each other theory. And then there's 
subatomic theory, quantum mechanical theory, which is usually based on gravitons, right? These theoretical particles that carry gravitational force between other particles. Well, Einstein's theory doesn't work at subatomic levels. No one's ever observed a graviton, and we already know that Newton's stuff doesn't hold up if you get to really, really, really large scale or really, really small scale. So none of these actually work all the time. So we don't have a really good general purpose theory of gravity, yet we do have a law of gravity. Laws are simply describing reality. While theories are explaining the why something happens, these are not trying to explain. They are simply saying what will happen, right? They are mathematical distillations of the observations we make, right? That 9.81 meters per second squared that we just talked about. So now we can combine all these together. We can learn that a phenomenon, this thing we're trying to explain, this thing we're trying to describe with science, the pure mathematical distillation of observation, the what happens every time we do it, that's a law. The trying to decide how it works, why it happens the way it does, that's the theory and hypothesis loop. Every hypothesis, every prediction that holds makes a better theory, and every better theory allows more elaborate hypotheses. So now you should be able to connect theory, hypothesis, and law to a phenomenon we're trying to explain.